Well, thank you all for coming today um, to this uh, wonderful seminar. Um, as you know, we have uh, three very interesting speakers to um, somehow highlight a few examples of uh, what we tend to call the interface between research and policy. Um, we would all, you know, this is a research institution, so we would all like to know, well, at least to think that research is uh, very important when it comes to policies. Um, I'm not entirely sure myself. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of uh, experiences that I had. You know, my one of my previous bosses, uh, Professor David Nutt, he lost his uh, job because he, um, there to say that uh, evidence was more important than other things uh, and made some contentious comments that were not um, approved politically. So that's one thing to say. And on a previous occasion, I've been to several of these uh, meetings uh, discussing the importance of research in, um, in policy making. And uh, my, my friend Simon Wesley, who is now the president of the Royal College of Psychiatry, uh, as it's so well known for, made one of those contentious remarks, and he said, I believe in the power of scandals. <laughs> so um, let me first of all, let's move into the, uh, the speakers and the presentations. Our first speaker is uh, one of our own. Um, Dr. Mary Da Silva uh, is one of our is one of our senior lecturers. Uh, she's been here for longer than I have been, um, and she has been involved in a number of things, other than being the deputy director of the Global Mental Health Center. She's done uh, a lot of research in different countries and uh, been involved in several. Um, pieces of work in terms of trying to translate research to facilitate the uh, policy making process. So Mary, um, I'll let you. I did not introduce her lecture. I think I would let her really go ahead with it. Thank you. So I'm now petrified of losing my job, seeing as Ricardo is my new boss. He's just told me that anything controversial I say results in me losing my job. So I'm quickly going to rewrite my talk because <laughs> and I've also been reminded that this is being recorded and will be transmitted live and recorded for posterity and I have a reputation for saying uh, slightly controversial things so I'm actually really quite worried now. Um, So um, this is kind of weird for me because I'm an epidemiologist and I thought that's what I would be doing for the rest of my life. Um, but it actually turns out, certainly in the last three or four years, I spend most of my time, more than 50% of my time, I would say, doing things which are not directly research. And they're about influencing researchers, policymakers, practitioners, pretty much anyone I meet um, about the importance of global mental health. It wasn't what I set out to do, but it's actually now one of the driving forces behind what I do, and I, it's actually a really enjoyable part um, of being a global mental health researcher. So I'm going to give some somewhat personal, though maybe not quite so personal now, uh, reflections on um, some of the policy initiatives that I've been involved in in the last few years. And I'm going to start um, actually with a show of hands of who here doesn't work in global mental health. So about 15 20 percent so that's great there's some people to be converted excellent normally i speak to an audience of converted people so there's a few people left so for your benefit in case you are not completely convinced of why global mental health has to be a major global health priority i'm hoping to now persuade you of that fact very briefly three reasons i've learned i'm only allowed three things the health case social economic case and the human rights case three powerful reasons why policymakers have to invest in mental health. People with mental health problems have shorter lives and they have worse health. Shorter by up to 20 years, much worse physical health problems. Suicide, about a million people kill each other each year, kill, kill each other, kill themselves each year. Huge, huge disease burden. 
Case number two, mental health problems cause poverty, poverty causes mental health problems. Spiral of disadvantage causes poor parenting, school failure, domestic violence, toxic stress, poor development equals 1.6 trillion pounds worth of economic costs a year. That alone should be enough for a policymaker to want to invest. Number three, the human rights case. People with mental health problems are some of the most disadvantaged people on our planet. Um, they are often subject to serious abuse and in many countries are not protected by laws and are denied fundamental human rights. Three very strong, clear reasons why we should be investing. There are also three solutions which have an evidence base which we should be persuading policymakers to enact. Number one, we have to foster social and, econ and economic environments that promote mental health well-being. They promote mental health. Secondly, we need to expand access to community-based treatment and care to treat the people who do develop mental health problems. And thirdly, we have to advocate for the rights and representation of people with mental health problems to ensure that their human rights are protected and that the treatment and prevention programmes that are implemented meet their needs. The misalignment between the burden of disease and the societal cost caused by mental illness in comparison to the amount of investment invested in mental health is stark. And this is one of my favourite figures which really shows how clearly that misalignment is. So in low and middle income, in low income countries, for example, 25% of the years lived with disability are due to mental health problems. Yet only less than half of 1% of an already small health budget is spent on treating mental health problems. And this picture is mirrored across all income levels of countries. We are simply not investing anywhere near enough what we need to be investing to overcome the burden of mental health problems. So I hope that you are persuaded that this is an important issue that deserves global attention. So a quick uh, kind of run through of de policy developments in global mental health in the last 15 years, um, highlighting some of the things that I've been involved in uh, that have and haven't worked so well. So 2001 um, was really the kind of first time that any international organisation had stood up and said mental health deserves global attention. And that was the World Health Organisation with the World Mental Health Report. And to their credit, the World Health Organisation have consistently advocated for mental health to be on the global agenda. And a, a, a if not the most key player, I think, globally advocating for that change. Nothing really happened for quite a few years um, on the global stage until the 2007 Lancet series. And that was when I first became involved in these kind of bigger initiatives um, through being part of the writing group for that series. And we summarised the ev existing evidence base, meagre though it was, and importantly, we looked forward to the future to say what should happen. Um, and that was felt like a really pivotal moment at the time. It resulted in the foundation of the movement for global mental health, and it certainly raised the profile of global mental health as a research area to be interested in. In 2001, there was another pivotal event, which was um, the launch of the Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health. So this was a Delphi exercise, a consensus building exercise of hundreds of researchers from all around the world. And we came up with a list of priorities, of research priorities for global mental health. And that could have ended nowhere, just a list of priorities. But luckily, some funders chose to invest in those priorities. And two new funders that weren't significant global mental health funders came on the scene. Grand Challenges Canada and the National Institutes for Mental Health both announced large funding programmes. Now, when I say large, Grand Challenges have funded about £20 million over the last three or four years. NIMH, about £10 million. In the global scheme of things, that's really small amount of money. And that's for all of global mental health. So for us, it's big bucks, but it shows relative to other health conditions how little investment there is in global mental health research. 
A bit later that year, the second Lancet series came out, much less impact in my opinion. Uh, it was summarising kind of what had happened since the first series, and unfortunately not particularly much had happened because there hadn't been this kind of groundswell of investment. So there were more trials, which was great, but they found no new kind of scaled up programmes with decent large scale evaluations. So the implementation of mental health programmes was still not happening in 2001. 2013 was really, really important. So the World Health Organization launched the Mental Health Action Plan and every single of the 192 member states signed this action plan. And they've all agreed by 2020 to these four key objectives. They're supposed to strengthen effective leadership and governance for mental health. They're supposed to provide comprehensive integrated mental health and social care services in the community. They're supposed to do promotion and prevention strategies, and they're supposed to strengthen information systems and evidence and research so that we generate and create the evidence base for uh, what works. There's targets associated with these objectives and indicators to measure them. The problem is there's no large scale funding for countries to actually implement the Mental Health Action Plan. So we have a fantastic template that all these countries have signed up for and we are just waiting for the resources to be able to actually implement that action plan. So my first uh, experience of writing one of these policy reports was in December 2013 for the World Innovation Summit for Health. I was so excited when um, Vikram Patel and Sheikha Saxena asked me to collaborate with them to write the report. I thought this is like the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, and we worked for months and the mental health innovation team generated all these amazing case studies of different programs around the world. And we did a micro website and it was so exciting. And we went to Qatar, amazing event, beautifully resourced, butlers, business class, beautiful event. And the report was very well received. And Sung Su Shi came and, and was at the front of our session. She made a keynote, uh, her keynote address mentioned how mental health was so critically important. We were really, really excited. And unfortunately, nothing's happened after that report. I have copies in a box, which are gathering dust, and you're very welcome to take one, because <laughs> they're blocking up my office. Um, and I think it's been a real lesson for me that a report doesn't mean anything unless you have action following that report to make the recommendations of that report actually happen and unfortunately in the in the case of the wish uh, summit there was resources to write the report but no resources to actually follow up to enact the recommendations of the report 2004 is my favorite year to date and you can see how the time gap between these policy developments is getting shorter and shorter feels like we're starting to build some momentum. So 2004, the UK government decides that global mental health is important, which is fantastic news. They hold uh, a disability and development inquiry, and this is a committee which is actually supposed to tell DFID what to do. They have the power to say to DFID, you should do X, Y, and Z. And they included mental health under disability, which was fantastic news. And Graham gave evidence at the inquiry, and they wrote this amazing report which has my favourite words in the English language in it, which is the report recommended, the inquiry recommended that DFID thoroughly appraise the case for spending more in the following areas. And if DFID decides not to increase its spending, it should explain its reasons to the committee. Number one on investment, mental health. So excited. <coughs> so DFID responded and said, we agree. We will appraise the case for funding and we'll review all of our four-year spending plans. Um, and we're waiting for the results of that spending review to come through. The other thing that happened at that time is that uh, Graham and others launched the Fundamental SDG campaign to get mental health included in the Sustainable Development Goals. I will not speak about that because Graham will. But important advocacy moment uh, for global mental health. And then in the same year, that summer, um, we launched the Mental Health Innovation website, which again, I will talk a bit more about at the end. Same year, um, Lord Crisp, who used to run the NHS and now is chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Global Health, decided that mental health needed even more attention and um, commissioned me to write a report for the group. Um, to see what the UK was doing about global mental health, not just DFID, but the, all of the kind of UK funding uh, scene, and to make recommendations. 
really, really interesting process. The review found that actually DFID was one of the best development agencies in the world because they do fund some mental health. They fund a £6 million research project called Prime, um, and they fund isolated pockets of um, <coughs> mental health programmes. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, it's quite a limited and isolated portfolio. It wasn't good enough, but it was something. Um, there are some amazing NGOs in the UK, like Basic Needs, that do really um, incredible work in many countries. But most NGOs in the UK do not touch mental health at all. Oxfam, Save the Children, etc., etc., have no mental health in their portfolios whatsoever. And in the NHS, there were a small number of really great health partnership schemes um, between UK NHS trusts and other um, partners abroad to strengthen mental health services abroad. And they were really great examples, but again, a small in number and isolated in scope. So no surprise that our recommendations were that everybody should do more. And in particular, DFID should do what the inquiry said it should do and reappraise its funding for global mental health. Now, John T. Rowland, um, who's the policy officer for the group, he was amazing. He knew everybody in Parliament. He knew who to speak to. He knew how to frame the question in the right way that would get the MP to attend the session. Unfortunately, he got offered a job at KPMG and left. <laughs> Still haven't forgiven him. Um, so he... Um, all of the policy recommendations, his job as policy officer is to take the recommendations of the report and make them happen. So convene meetings of UK NGOs to persuade them of the importance of, of including mental health in their programmes, to have high level meetings with DFID to you know, make the case for why they should and how they should include mental health in their programmes. Unfortunately, none of that work has happened because they haven't replaced him. Apparently after the election they will be, so I'm very hopeful that in the next few months we will be able to get to work on the, re on the actual making the recommendations happen. I also have copies of this which are gathering dust on my shelf, um, but I hope they will be not gathering dust for very much longer. Okay, my uh, second to last example is very recent and it's by far my favourite because it's completely based on no evidence whatsoever, but it's the biggest policy impact that we've had. So Prime was the project that DFID funds, the £6 million project that DFID funds, and it's amazing. It's the best project ever. Um, we are designing district-level mental health care plans in five countries, and um, in India, they've designed the programme um, to be operational in three sub-district hospitals. It's working really well. We started the evaluation. Don't know whether it works yet, but we're collecting the data. This February, we had our annual meeting there in India. All the country partners came, WHO came, um, and these two lovely men uh, sitting in the end, studiously taking notes, who are the ministers of health uh, in Mandra Pradesh, they um, loved it, absolutely loved it. And within a month, the PI of Prime in India had been invited to sit on a statewide steering committee to design a mental health action plan for the whole of the state, covering 27 million people. A month after that, he's out in the field visiting 51 district hospitals and training them in mental health treatment and care. That's within a few months. We haven't even finished collecting the baseline data for Prime in these three sub-district hospitals yet. But that one event, this big policy, you know, kind of press event, catalyzed the state government to invest in mental health. Now, we're seeing this as an opportunity. We're going to run with it. We're going to keep providing the evidence as we go along because there's no way that we could stand back and say, stop, wait two years. We haven't done the evaluation. We don't know what we're doing. We've got to run with it. And I personally think it's the most exciting thing ever that now 27 million people could be receiving um, our intervention. The last thing um, is hasn't happened yet. It's the World Bank meeting, um, which has been promised for a while. It was delayed due to Ebola, but it's definitely happening in, in April next year. And it's a joint meeting between the World Bank and the World Health Organization, um, just on depression. And um, we re it remains to be seen whether this will be the kind of critical turning point in global mental health, whether this is the point when we actually get the investment that we need. We'll have a captive audience of finance ministers and international donors, and it is our job to persuade them that they have to start funding mental health.
Now, that's just a kind of a few seeds of policy work that I've been involved in. But there are some really underlying themes. And um, last year, we uh, commissioned a report by ODI, who were a kind of policy think tank, about why global mental health was such a difficult issue to get policy traction on. And I highly recommend you read the report. It's on the Mental Health Innovation website. They came up with 10 reasons why mental health basically fails as a policy issue. And I think we as a field need to understand these barriers and think of ways to overcome them. So the most important one is heterogeneity. If you think about what mental health is, it includes depression, schizophrenia, dementia, autism, a huge range of disparate conditions. And it's very hard to get a single policy ask out of those range of conditions. There's no scale up ARTs, scale up bed nets. That's a simple single policy ask that policymakers can get behind. We don't have that in mental health, which is one of the reasons why the World Bank meeting on depression is only on depression, because we felt it would be a way of coalescing, you know, having a, a narrower focus that policymakers could actually understand apart from anything else. Stigma, huge barrier. You don't see people marching in the streets demanding treatment for mental health care services. It's much easier to brush it under the carpet. Agency of the service user is related to that. There are a huge lack of service user organisations in lower middle income countries. But more than that, there's this underlying stigma of policymakers and service providers that don't believe that people with mental health problems can actually advocate for their services because they're apparently mentally impaired. Lack of data, huge problem, particularly for local level policy making. In most countries, there will not be national level prevalence data for the majority of these conditions. So if you're asking a policymaker in Malawi to design a policy on schizophrenia, you don't even know how many people in Malawi have schizophrenia. It's very difficult to make a policy on that. And if you don't know the prevalence, it's extremely unlikely that you're going to have a locally developed and evaluated intervention for schizophrenia that's relevant and developed in Malawi, which would have policy traction in that country. Under diagnosis, most people with mental health problems do not receive treatment. They are not diagnosed. They are not marching into hospitals demanding treatment. So it's a hidden problem, which is very easy for policymakers to ignore. Going back to the no single policy ask, there's also no magic bullet. Mental health treatment is an individual journey. It's going to be different for everybody. It's going to be complicated. It's going to be costly. It's not a simple thing to solve. So there's no magic bullet that you can say to policymakers, this is the intervention that you need to invest in, because it's a whole suite of interventions, which is health system strengthening, that they need to invest in. And that's a hard sell. The lack of financial investment in mental health research and in mental health service delivery means that there's no pressure to change. There are not, for example, a huge number of psychiatrists in these countries stamping their feet and demanding better equipment in their hospitals or a higher number of psychiatric nurses. There's simply not enough manpower, women power, in the in research or in practice to create enough of a noise that policymakers in their countries have to listen to it. The role of the informal sector means that the public sector can be absolved of, the, of responsibility. So a lot of treatment and care for mental health problems is done by families in the informal sector. And it's not, you know, these people aren't turning up at hospitals and, and when they are, but they're not being identified as having mental health problems. So again, it's easy to brush it under the carpet. Something which Graham will speak to is the lack of international commitment and engagement. So without mental health, for example, in the MDGs, there's no international incentive, there's no target that the country is supposed to be meeting, which makes it need to implement mental health services. And lastly, there are no really effective global networks for mental health advocacy or exchange of knowledge. And the last one is the one that the Mental Health Innovation Network is really trying to target. So the Mental Health Innovation Network, <laughs> What we really need to do to make effective policy change is to link up all these different disparate groups of stakeholders under a single policy ask. What that policy ask is, we haven't decided, but I personally think it should be the World Mental Health Action Plan because 192 countries have agreed to it. We've got a clear plan of action. We've got clear targets and indicators. That's what we should be putting our money behind, in my opinion. 
So we need an overarching effort to link all of these different stakeholders under this uniting umbrella. How do we do that? Luckily, Grand Challenges Canada are a very foresightful funder and they realised that we needed this kind of network, particularly initially among researchers, to share the information that they're generating so that people don't keep reinventing the wheel. Global mental health, there are not enough researchers and there's not enough money. So therefore, you cannot reinvent the wheel. We have to learn from each other. We have to build on which, what each other is doing in order to be efficient in directing our resources in the areas which are most promising. So we got together with the World Health Organization to found the Mental Health Innovation Network with the goal to facilitate the development and scale up of effective interventions or innovations to improve mental health. So we're talking about a very focused thing. We want to facilitate the scale up of effective interventions evidence-based interventions into policy. That's our mission. The primary vehicle is our website, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you do. It's got three sections. The um, most important, I think, for policy right now is the innovation database, which is a database currently of 110 odd case studies. And these are case studies of mental health programs, of research projects, of interventions. And the key underlying theme being that they've all got some form of evaluation. So we've got case studies. So if somebody says, I want to do depression in Malawi, we can say, right, here's a similar project. There's depression in Malawi. Or there's nothing in Malawi, but there's something in Kenya. And most of these projects are not in the published literature. They're things which are out there in the real world but are actually almost invisible in the kind of normal way of searching for things. And every single policy report that I've written, starting from WISH, has always drawn on this repository of case studies. And it's a really powerful, because people want to know what works. They want evidence and examples of things in the real world that are actually working. And going back to the 2001 Lancet series, where they didn't find any evaluation of scaled up programmes through looking at the published literature, well, we've now got 110 examples a few years later. The second one is resources. So this links to the case studies, but also expands it. And it could be a resource could be anything from a systematic review, a policy brief, an infographic, a capacity building material on how to write a policy brief. Um, and really with the aim that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So if somebody wants to do a, you know, a cognitive behavioral therapy, they could look at other people's training manuals and other people's intervention guides and work with those, network with those people and then adapt them for their setting. And lastly, the community section has blogs, webinars, this is one of them, um, forums for discussion, um, member profiles where you can search and network with other members and also organisations. We've only been going nine months, but we've already got nearly 900 members. We're growing by about 100 members a month and 96 organisations. So I'm really hopeful that bearing in mind how small this field is, um, that we really can grow to be a, a truly global network. So looking forward, the three things that we really want to focus on are to expand the network reach and membership, particularly bringing policymakers into that network um, to create a global knowledge exchange and advocacy movement. We want to increase our bank of what works in global mental health, and that includes strengthening the evaluations of mental health programmes, which generally are very poor. So we improve the level of evidence we have. And thirdly, we want to build the capacity of researchers and practitioners to actually influence policy. So we're creating, with ODI, a lot of capacity building materials about how to influence policy, about how to get research into policy. We're doing, even doing country visits with some selected projects which have been identified as being likely to be able to go to scale. And then we're having country visits to actually map the policy environment to understand the key drivers that that project needs to pull in order to have an influence in their local context. And I just want to finish by saying a massive thank you to all of the people that have worked on the Mental Health Innovation Network over the last few years. The team, um, particularly the team I work with here at LSHGM, are an amazing group of women, um, and I'm extremely grateful to them for all their hard work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Mary, uh, for sharing with us your excitement, frustration, and of course, most importantly, your achievements. Um, 
Our second speaker uh, is probably very well known to most of you here, Professor Graham Thornycroft. Uh, doesn't need an introduction. Uh, he's a real champion in so many different things. Uh, he's a professor in community psychiatry at the Maudsley Institute of Psychiatry at King College Hospital. He's been involved in so many different things that um, I probably I would be wasting your time uh, mentioning. Uh, but he has been involved, and we are so happy um, that he joined the Global Mental Health course at some point. Uh, he has been involved in several important initiatives, uh, not least uh, leading the mental health and the MH gap uh, package of intervention at the World Health Organization. So he's here to talk to us a little bit about his new uh, interest in advocating for introducing mental health into the SDGs. Graham, over to you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Can you hear me, everybody? Good evening. So I'm going to tell you a short story, and this is about sustainable development goals. So as Mary mentioned, the starting point of the story goes back to 2000 and is the story of the Millennium Development Goals, which contained about mental health absolutely nothing at all. So this is now about to become history because the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, finished this year. And for some time has been a very complex and large-scale industry to develop the successor goals called Sustainable Development Goals, which begin later this year and are also expected to run for the next 15 years, which I shall call SDGs. So what are they? So you can see here the key characteristics. There are proposed set of goals with associated targets and indicators relating to future international development. So this is international development as a whole, certainly not limited to health questions. Secondly, they will replace the MDGs later this year. So it's important to understand the structure of these SDGs. At the top, there are a number of goals, and there are currently 17 goals proposed across a whole range of global warming, wealth generation, and other aspects of international collaboration and global development. Under those come a series of targets, and at the moment there are about 169 targets proposed. And under those come indicators, namely specific measurable ways to track progress to the targets and to the goals. So that's the structure um, as we go along. So I really got involved in this in July of last year when, having been slightly interested, I thought, well, let's look at this in some detail. And then I found this document by the Open Working Group which effectively is a pre-final draft of the final SDGs. And when I looked at it, I was really shocked. So what did I find? That there is one health goal out of the 17, goal three, and in there, there are, as I recall, eight different targets. And what do they say about mental health? One is about NCDs, neurological and so on, it says, and address mental health and neurological disorders and promote mental health and well-being. So in all of the goals and the targets and the indicators, as of July last year, that was all we got. So you could say it's better than nothing, but it's not very much. And I was initially despondent, and then I was angry. I thought, well, we can just hope that this will improve, or we can act. So I contacted a colleague who's been quite open about his history of depression, who is Lord Dennis Stevenson. And he then arranged a meeting with DFID, so we went along to meet some senior people who just got back from this meeting in New York developing the Open Working Group draft. And they were fortunately very open, and we said, how much support is there for mental health in the SDGs? And the key official said, to be honest, not very much. There's actually not very much momentum on this issue. So we said to him, well, okay, thank you for being so direct. How do we generate momentum? He said, you have to get support of member states and coalitions of member states. 
So the next thing, and you can see here, it's interesting actually, this is given as an acknowledgement in that open working group document about the groups who had been involved and who supported this particular goal three. And you can see here all sorts of groups involved, major group for children and youth and so on, and even the World Animal Protection Group. Was there anybody with any interest in mental health, not just involved, but knowing that these discussions are going on at that stage? No. We were nowhere near the scene. So I thought, well, what do we do? Well, the first thing is to start raising the issue. So I contacted my colleague Vikram Patel, you'll know from the Centre of Global Mental Health. And we put together an editorial in the BMJ. BMJ were kind enough to publish this, saying there is a case, and you heard some of the core sort of architectural details of the case earlier from Mary, about the huge impact across the world of mental disorders. I won't repeat the stats for you, you know this. And then to our surprise, the BMJ came fully in support behind it, and they did a separate editorial, the same, this was mid-August now, last year, saying, yes, BMJ supports this initiative. Well, that's, that's something, that's a really quite a good start. And then we said, well, let's create uh, a consortium to create momentum. So we wrote to a number of individuals and groups and said, uh, there's no money, but would you like to join together with us and press for a reasonable and a proportionate inclusion of mental health issues in the SDGs? And then within weeks, more and more groups across the whole spread of the mental health sector worldwide said, yes, this is important, we want to come in. So we had some professional groups, we had the World Psychiatric Association, the World Medical Association, um, the American Psychiatric Association, we had service user groups, we had the Center for Global Mental Health, Movement for Global Mental Health, Basic Needs, and so on. And you can see here that within weeks, about 40 organizations across all of these sectors unified and coalesced, and this is rare to have a common front of this sort behind uh, doing something. And then we called the initiative hashtag Fundamental SDG, that's the, um, uh, the Twitter, but it's called Fundamental SDG. And then I contacted a brilliant colleague uh, who happens to be here called Nicole Fortruba and said, would you like to work with me and coordinate this? And I'm glad to say yes. So most of the weaknesses of this initiative where you can blame on me, most of the uh, strengths you can actually attribute fairly to Nicole's work. And then a, an outstanding photographer and filmmaker contacted us and said, can I help? We said, yes, what can you? He said, can I make a film? We said, that would be wonderful. So he created this film because he'd just been traveling around Africa doing a photo montage of conditions in certain African psychiatric institutions. He happened to be working in that continent at that time. So I'll show you the film. Thank 
So we then posted that on the website, and people, many people said they were very moved. Also, many people said, well, this is giving one particular content a bad name. It could be even seen as racist. We said, well, we happen to have a volunteer who would got material from that particular continent, but we now posted other films, other materials from many other parts of the world on the fundamental SDG website. So then we had to say, well, it's all very well to complain, but it's much more useful to propose something, to go into the active mode. So we then had the tricky um, stage of trying to bring together these various groups, now 4045, to come around a common and simple, clear platform, bearing in mind the barriers identified by Mary of where we can go wrong. So we first of all proposed this, that there should be a target, provision of mental and physical health and social care service of people with mental disorders in parity with resources for services addressing physical health. And this was deliberately linking up with the idea of parity and universal health coverage. Now, what that would mean in particular places and times, well, that's to be decided. But there should be, in principle, the same approach applied on a par, whether you have a mental or a physical condition or both. We then created our website, and we started getting people signing up and people sending their quotes. And both individuals and organizations did, and we had hundreds of people very quickly joining in behind this sort of voluntary free association of people. You can see, for example, uh, this is a quote from a member. A deliberate and concerted awareness campaign offering solutions to their socioeconomic problems is therefore needed at the time, especially when the target population of mental health issues is hard to reach, a colleague from India. And we had many, many of these quotes from all over the world saying, yes, we must do something. This is so long overdue. We then wanted to use other methods to get the message out far and wide. So I contacted the agent of the actor in this country, Stephen Fry, who may be known to people in many countries, and said, can you tweet about it? And the agent said, if you say exactly what day and what time and what the message is, and you give an abbreviated tiny Earl web address, then maybe. So I sent in, I followed my instructions exactly, and then to my amazement, he sent out the message about this uh, initiative to his 7.4 million Twitter followers. So I call that scaling up. <laughs> <laughs> and then we thought, well, one way, certainly not the only or even perhaps the best way, but one way to get the information out into the public domain is through publications, especially rapid turnaround open access journals. You can get sometimes within weeks material out and published through some of the journals if they act promptly. So we started then a whole series of papers looking at different aspects of the case from different points of view. This one, for example, is an article giving examples from um, the effective provision of care in Ethiopia. This is a paper showing uh, so before and after case studies. Uh, this is a particular um, woman who is described when she wasn't treated and then she got treatment and she effectively um, essentially recovered quite quickly when treatment was available. Um, I won't go through all the details. This is the man in uh, also had a severe mental illness and he received treatment and then he was able to recover to the extent that he didn't just have the treatment but he then became a teacher as a service user participant, an advocate, a pioneer to contribute towards the wider scaling up efforts in Ethiopia. And there are a number of other papers which is, we're now working on with colleagues to make exactly the same point, to make it quite clear that we can deliver effective and affordable treatments even in the lowest income countries. Because in many policymakers' minds, as Mary mentioned, there is real doubt about we know if whether we know what we can do 
to improve the situation. We have to make that quite clear. Another point, I think, is that mental illnesses, because of the mortality stats, it's in the Western countries, 15 to 20 years, uh, less life expectancy. Recent data from Fekadu et al. shows a 30-year reduction among people in Ethiopia who have a mental illness compared with the host population, even with their, um, that country's their life expectancy. So that mental illnesses are killer diseases is another key message for policymakers, because so often they will say, we're dealing with first with HIV, TB, malaria, then immunizations, maybe NCDs, and you're way down the queue because you are not advocating for killer diseases. Well, that's wrong, and we have to make that case. So we then went on the offensive with a whole series of papers about the, um, the different aspects, about the impact of mental illnesses, about comorbidity of mental and uh, physical disorders. But does this all really matter? If we are actually included in the SDGs, will it make a difference? Well, uh, we don't know yet. Arguably, the investment in HIV, malaria, and TB has multiplied massively, in part maybe in large part because they're included and so clearly tracked with respect to the MDGs. And it's the indicators here that are the critical issue. Because year by year, our tables of the coverage of antiretroviral treatment for HIV published in many countries, and you can see both the absolute rate, the percentage of individuals who are HIV positive getting treatment, and you can see the relative standing of those percentages country by country, and ministers of health pay attention to that. They then co-invest and put some of their own resources in. It attracts external donor funds, and people want to get their percentages higher and higher. We don't yet have anything like that for international league tables of coverage, and the starting point in many countries is down at about 5 or 10% of people actually receiving effective treatment. So we then had um, papers also led by members of the consortium. This is Professor Gureji from Ibadan in Nigeria. Um, we then thought about what can we learn from the HIV and TB malaria fields. Again, a paper led by Nicole here. And here we um, summarize some of the key uh, findings. That if we are not included in the targets, because remember it's just a health goal, and specifically in the indicators, then there's a major opportunity that will have been lost. And we then got support from other colleagues in other global mental health centers, including uh, Harry Munison colleagues working in Melbourne, all working in exactly the same direction. So we wanted to press and press and press with a sort of volley of these materials. But from the, it's very interesting actually getting involved in this, how difficult it is to know how the United Nations works. For example, just as a country sends an ambassador to another country, countries also send their ambassadors to the United Nations, as if the United Nations is a country. But those individuals are not called ambassadors, they're called missions. And they have their own office, and often they will have within that ambassadorial group in New York a lead person called a health attaché leading on health-related issues. So we had to find out step by step the sort of architecture of who's involved and then the sequence of how the negotiations take place, who meets and when, and how is influence made to bear. So we then also wanted to go wider than the narrow sort of focus of academic papers. We got coverage in some national press. Here you can see a paper in The Independent. We had coverage as well um, in The Guardian, which is favorable. There was, a, in early this year, a very um, high-profile conference at the LSE in uh, considering uh, Kofi Annan talking about depression. We had a clear mention supporting the initiative in the New York Times in the leader in about March of this year. So we're trying to get sort of this into the public domain, not just the, the research domain. It then became clear about Christmas that our first proposal which was to have a whole new mental health target within the health goal, was not going to succeed. There was no appetite in all the information we got back from people involved in these processes for any more. In fact, the opposite. The information we got is that there was a strong appetite to reduce and to simplify and to cut down. Remembering 17 goals, 169 targets. So all the momentum was to have fewer goals and perhaps fewer targets. So our proposal to have a mental health specific target was not going to get anywhere. So we had a difficult point. We had to renegotiate our proposals, again, throughout all of these individuals and organizations, and we had a very rapid consultation progress over the Christmas period. 
And fortunately, we were able to agree. And you can see in the black the previous or the current version of the health targets within the health goal. And you can see in the yellow what we agreed as the edits that we wanted to be inserted into this target. So first of all, in the heading you can see here, including physical and mental health, we then said, the, as Mary said, the best route to avoiding diplomatic stalemate and logjam is to go where there's already complete international agreement, which is on the World Health Organization Mental Health Global Action Plan, already endorsed at the General Assembly two years ago in Geneva. And that includes important elements for coverage and for suicide reduction and other parts of what we want to achieve. So we simply inserted that as a sort of portfolio with all of the provisions that it contained. And also here we said universal health coverage for physical and mental disorders. Why? Because you look a bit further for these weasley little words in these sort of uh, official statements because it says here essential health care for safe effective um, for all essential health care services. And we could see at a glance that if the essential health care service was maintained, that would leave the door open for countries and continents to say, yes, we will do this for some physical conditions, but in our judgment, mental health care is not an essential service. It's not core. So to close that door, we deliberately want to insert here, quite clearly, for physical and mental disorders. So we propose these as edits to the uh, goal three and to the specific targets within goal three. But as I mentioned earlier, I think the, sort of the, the gold dust here is the indicators. What will be measured and what will countries feel judged upon and be motivated to change their behavior and their investment, either for good or for shame avoidance reasons. And this is where we, again, quite quickly came to a consensus across our consortium. And this is this. We proposed two things, and you could imagine all sorts of indicators that could be included, but we whittled this down to two upon which we agreed. First, coverage. Uh, sorry, first of all, suicide rates. So to add suicide into an existing indicator related to non-communicable diseases. And secondly, coverage, meaning here, the proportion of people with severe mental illness who are actually getting treatment I mean, exactly how to define operationalized to be defined, but let's say treatment in the first case. Now, you could propose immediately five or ten other very strong candidates, but these are the two we happen to choose on the basis that uh, having some would be better than none. And the way we w uh, went about this is we then came across, and you keep coming across whole new parts of this huge mechanism, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Solutions Network. And they were doing, based in New York, a lot of work developing indicators for the SDGs. So we had various phone conferences, we worked with them, and we proposed these indicators. They said, yes, we'll accept that. They said, but we only want you to have one. You're allowed one mental health indicator. And we said, no, we want two. <laughs> we said, well, you can't have two, you can have one. We said, okay, well, we'll have this one, coverage, and then we'll add suicide to that one. We'll piggyback on that. They said, all right. <laughs> So we proposed that this sustainable, this solutions network said, yes, we agree with that. In parallel, a group within the WHO were making proposals and they agreed it with exactly the same wording of the same two proposed indicators and we felt great. Now we're making some progress. And then there was a sort of moment of uh, realization that this solutions network is a body, it's a think tank of the United Nations that proposes things, but it doesn't decide, it doesn't dispose because there's another group called UN STAT which is the United Nations Statistics Department, which actually proposes the real indicators that will be discussed in the real chamber when it comes to the crunch. So we talked to these people at the Solutions Network, and they supported us, but then we realized this was still an advisory group, and we weren't, well, we're making some progress, but we weren't actually there yet. So you can see here that we then added in to their proposals this one about adding suicide, although in a, a late version, they even stuck it in brackets and then they added in this coverage uh, target as well. And then we remembered where we started, which is the idea of momentum. And how do you build momentum? By member states and groups of member states coming together. 
So we then wrote, or at least Nicole wrote, on behalf of the consortium, to all the countries of the world, to their overseas affairs and foreign affairs departments and ministries, saying, we would like you to support these proposals. We're now getting in perhaps 20 or 30 coming back. This is an example. This would be some of the more favorable responses we've had, where Malaysia says, yes, we support this initiative. Many of the countries will say, uh, we fully support the Open Working Group, which, all, which has a mental health section in there already. And some will say, um, we're committed to the creation of wealth and health across the world and support the whole process. So that's the sort of range of responses we get from these, uh, their diplomats. So we're now in the process of trying to get uh, individual countries to express support. I then went back to my country uh, here and had a meeting with the relevant minister in the Department for International Development. Interestingly, um, I then asked for the support of the then mental health minister within the Department of Health and also his predecessor. So they're the last two mental health ministers in this country who were then uh, fully supporting this initiative. So they were all from the same party, the DFID minister and the two, the current and the previous mental health ministers. And we had an interesting debate. And the minister then agreed that we would work with her officials to further develop the indicators which we're now doing. So this really brings us to the end of the story because the future is uncertain. Um, we will not change um, the presence of health as a goal within the overall SDG. We don't know yet if there'll be any greater presence of mental health in the targets as we have proposed, um, but we have no clear indication at the moment that that will be accepted. Um, we're now pressing hard at the third level the indicators and that's still to be decided. So what have I learnt? We should have started years ago. <laughs> you know, you, you wouldn't start here. We're in a highly competitive advocacy market. It's easy for us in the mental health sector to say, oh dear, oh dear, nobody takes us seriously, there's stigma, we're not given much resource. And that's easy to say, and it's wrong. The facts are, is that so far we have not advocated clearly and strongly enough to get our point of view across in the major international organizations and forums of the world. And we need to learn how to do that. We need to make cross-sector platforms with the international development field, the international disability field, and explain why we're a part of the solution for all of their problems as well. We need to be highly disciplined. We need to learn from the HIV field where the stakeholders have come together with a very narrow and very recurrent set of proposals which has been relentless and highly successful. And we haven't yet done that. We are too often divided between the service users and psychologists and psychiatrists and so on, a high income, low income, pro global health, anti mental health. We need to be highly disciplined around a core series of long term strong propositions. And it's all still to play for. So if you'd like to support this initiative, please do contact me or Nicole tonight. Join us on Facebook, join us on the web, and make your voice heard. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Grant. Um, I hope that this is not the end of the story, as you said. <laughs> it's just one more battle in a, in a long war that we will, in the end, win. Um, the uh, next speaker um, is my friend Sumitra Patare from, from India, uh, another very long-term uh, activist, I will say, in mental health. Um, he has been involved in so many things and he's been, uh, I would say, fundamental in the, in, in the passing of the mental reason, uh, mental health law in India. So Sumitra will be joining us via uh, internet, I guess. No, it's on a recorded PowerPoint. Oh, through a recorded, <coughs> okay. Uh, but that doesn't really matter if you want to ask questions. I think Sumitra will be available to, to answer. Okay, so let's, let's see what Sumitra has to say.
Hi, good afternoon everybody. Uh, this is uh, a very unusual experience for me where uh, I have recorded a talk with my slides and I've never done this before. Uh, so we're just trying to bring the volume back. Uh, as high as possible. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Uh, this is a very unusual experience for me where uh, I have recorded a talk with my slides and I've never done this before. Uh, so you will have to apologize to me. Uh, I apologize. I have to apologize. Sorry. <laughs> I have to apologize to you if I get this all wrong. It's, it's quite unusual just staring at your screen, not having an audience in front and trying to do this talk. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to present this, uh, uh, do this presentation at this seminar. Uh, I don't know who else is in the audience, but uh, thank you to uh, to Ricardo, to uh, Mary and Lucy for asking me to be present via the video link and also through this talk at the seminar. Before I uh, begin uh, my talk, I just wanted to uh, highlight some uh, key points that you need to keep in mind and to see my presentation in the context of these points. Uh, first, uh, my uh, uh, my presentation is largely focused on, on my India experience. So in that sense, it is very context specific and may not be applicable to high income countries like say the UK uh, or, or low and middle income countries with other kinds of political systems uh, such as, uh, uh, such as, I don't know, India is a very, very noisy democracy and as uh, famously uh, said by Amartya Sen, we are we are very uh, very argumentative in our approach to solving problems. Uh, it may also not uh, apply to other low and middle income countries from other regions, uh, such as Africa or Latin America, which have uh, different kinds of histories and trajectories and how their mental health systems have developed. Uh, the second uh, point I wanted to highlight was that this is actually still a work in progress. It's, it's not yet complete. So as you will see in the presentation, things are still happening as we go along. Uh, and and we, are, we are not looking back at it with all the tasks uh, completed. Uh, the third point I wanted to make was that uh, uh, I'm going to focus my presentation largely on the process uh, and, and on uh, on the kind of things that do not necessarily get documented uh, during uh, when when these things are written up. Uh, you know, I was really surprised uh, when I was doing this, uh, when I got involved in this whole process, was that uh, there's a lot of material on content as to what should go into the mental health law, what should go into a mental health policy. But there's actually very little process related material. Uh, and that may not be just accidental. Process is so context dependent and what works in a particular country may not necessarily work in another country. Uh, but there is very little process documentation uh, that you can find when one is looking at how to bring about changes uh, into policy and legislation. Uh, as some of you or all of you might very well know, mental health is not necessarily a high health priority in India. Uh, the federal government uh, devotes only about 2% of its health budget to mental health. Uh, and you need to understand what we've done in the last 3-4 years in this context uh, of it not being a high priority. And lastly, uh, I wanted to specifically make a note of the point that, that you know, there's been a lot of advocacy for change. Uh, for mental health uh, in India in the last 10-15 years and, and uh, a lot of this advocacy uh, has been something that we've built upon. So I do not want you to leave with the assumption that uh, all change that happened has only happened because uh, 
we've done something in the last three, four years. One of the first points that I wanted to highlight uh, was the fact that uh, opportunity comes uh, when you probably least expect it. Uh, you know, uh, mental health act uh, amendments or, or a mental health policy was never a priority for the government of India in 2010. Uh, but uh, we suddenly got an opportunity because of two specific events which were not necessarily mental health related. The first was that India ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2007. And as a part of that ratification, the government made a list of laws that needed to be amended. And so the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare identified that the Mental Health Act needed amendments for it to be compliant with the CRPD. And therefore got involved in amending the Act. And the initial brief uh, to me from the Ministry in 2010 was very clear. Uh, they wanted minimal amendments to the existing Mental Health Act of 1987 and they wanted us to finish the task in three months. Um, you know, this was in February 2010. Uh, they wanted a task completed, the job completed by June. They were going to go to Parliament with the amendments in July and hopefully all of this would be completed by October of 2010. And as you'll notice as I go along uh, that uh, things have worked out very differently. The, the second important opportunity uh, that we got was because of the presence of supportive officials in the ministry. And, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, we had a really good set of uh, very sympathetic officials, senior officials in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, without whom uh, none of this would have been possible. So, so these were the two key opportunities that came uh, our way and when I say our I mean the mental health sector's way and what we did uh, with this was that the first and most important thing we decided to do was uh, to try and broad base this entire opportunity and what I mean by broad base is the ministry wanted a law uh, a new law or amended law and we had discussions with the ministry uh, and explained to them that uh, a law without a policy or a program will not work uh, you need to look at the law, policy, and program uh, as, as a holistic process. Uh, India has always had a district mental health program for the last three decades. Uh, it hasn't worked very well, and it could probably work better, but we did have a program. Uh, we've never had a policy. In 68 years after independence, uh, India did not have a mental health policy. So one of the first tasks that we had was we we persuaded the ministry that they need to appoint a policy group, appoint a group of stakeholders who could then come up with a draft of a national mental health policy and could also look at the existing program and suggest changes to it to make it more effective. And so in, uh, in about mid-2010 uh, or early 2011, I forget when it was now, but the government appointed uh, a mental health policy group uh, yeah, with about 11 members uh, and it had representation of academics, mental health professionals, uh, it had uh, uh, users, uh, it also had family caregivers and it had some NGO activists on it. So it was a pretty diverse group representing different stakeholder opinions. And myself and a colleague of mine uh, provided technical support to the ministry to draft the new law. And, and I was also a member of the policy group. So in a sense, there was a certain degree of continuity between the law and the policy. And since all these things were happening at the same time, uh, simultaneously, it was quite easy to see how and to ensure that the law and the policy actually went in sync. I think one of the lessons that I learned out of all of this was uh, the need to build a coalition. And I use the word coalition rather than an alliance. Uh, because a coalition, as I see it, is only a temporary alliance. Uh, none of us, uh, all of us involved in the process have uh, had our own views. Uh, we wanted to do things differently, but, but we kind of agreed that there were some basic minimum things that we all wanted to see happening and that we would work together to ensure that those basic minimum things actually happen. 
we uh, we also took the route of consultation uh, we had a lot of consultation on the law uh, and we tried to ensure that the consultation was very inclusive uh, and involved all stakeholders so for example we had uh, a re we had regional consultations in five parts of the country uh, we also had a national consultation and after each consultation uh, we uh, would make amendments to the draft of the law and then put it out for pub into the public domain um, consultation and inclusiveness has its own problems uh, some stakeholder groups felt that they had a primacy of opinion and that their views should be respected or only their views should be respected uh, other stakeholder groups felt that nobody else knew anything about mental health except them and so so it was always a difficult task trying to ensure inclusivity uh, we were also very keen to ensure that we actually got hold of uh, people who are not normally a part of the consultation process so for example user groups or caregiver groups uh, people who are not necessarily fluent in english uh, and and that they were represented in this consultation and the the aim of the consultation was really to to actually identify what might work or what might not work uh, to try and build a consensus and to try and get stakeholder groups to to compromise and and that is a really hard task uh, to get people to compromise uh, what what the ministry did uh, which i think was a sensible thing uh, is that the ministry very early on uh, said that there were going to be some things which were not negotiable so it was easy to talk about compromise when you had a set of non negotiables and and what i put up on the slide here is a series of non negotiable things that went into the mental health act or was or are supposed to be in the mental health act and one of them was uh, ects without anesthesia and muscle relaxants and uh, that has also led to some difficulties for example the indian uh, psychiatric society which represents the psychiatrists is very unhappy about it uh, and feel that uh, direct ect should not be banned in this way and actually came out with a consensus paper saying why they did not want it banned uh that is a story for another day but the point i'm trying to make is that even when you have non negotiables uh it does not necessarily work out that everyone accepts those non negotiables the other important learning for me and something that i will keep in mind is to respond to stakeholders uh, respond to stakeholders and respond fast uh very often we would find that there would be some kind of misrepresentation either intentional or accidental um, about the contents of the bill or the policy and it was very important to use all forms of communication including email uh, media uh, presentations at conferences to refute these misrepresentation with evidence and facts uh, we we also did try to clarify the contents of the bill as well as the policy and 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 I was really surprised to see how many people actually uh, do not read the documents uh, you you'll really be surprised people would come up at meetings and say I heard this and this is in the bill and you you actually know that none of that is in the bill and so clarifying uh, clarifying the contents explaining the contents was a really important task uh, in the last 3 or 4 years i myself went to at least 20 different 20 25 different meetings uh, organized by various groups like ngos family groups uh, professional associations to try and explain the 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 bill the new mental health law in as simple a language as possible that people can understand it so so the point really is that you do need to do a bit of hard sell you need to go out and meet different groups of stakeholders uh, and and you cannot just rely on the fact that people will read and understand and make sense of what is written and I, this is something that i for me this this is a personal learning too i think some of the personal issues that came up in the last 3 4 years uh firstly not to respond to personal attacks uh again this might be a very india specific uh, issue but uh, the number of personal attacks uh, that i have had to face in the last 3 or 4 years uh, is just been very uh, uh, too numerous
this to list and it was important to not respond to these personal attacks people will impute all sorts of motives to your actions and it's important to not get sucked into this uh, i i initially thought this was going to be an engagement for about 12 months and uh, it ended up being almost a 48 month or a 50 month engagement so so the other thing to learn out of this is that when they say it's going to take a year be prepared for four years uh the third and more important thing is that you need to to bring about closure uh closure as in completing the task and as you will see we still do not have closure on the whole process i i also felt that uh, one of the things that was done during this whole process was that we stuck to the middle ground uh, you know we had people who wanted uh, or suggested uh, a uh, very radical change on the other hand we had people who were ultra conservative and did not want any change and we tried to kind of stay in the middle ground because that's where the large majority are people want some change uh, but do not want too much change and change is something that is a process it's not going to happen overnight so we need to see this as an evolution uh, from where we are to where we want to get to and i don't think that the mental health bill or the policy that we have at the moment is perfect but it's a huge change from where we were and it takes us on the way to where we want to get to and finally the most important thing that i want you to remember is is the whole role of teamwork I mean, none of this would have been possible if there were only two or three or four people working on this we actually managed to galvanize a whole group of people uh, to do lots of things to provide support to provide um, provide uh, inputs or it, it's been a teamwork thing and i don't want you to feel that that all of this was done by a few of us because uh, and that is very important it's important that one shares the credit uh, with everybody is involved there's a, there's been a tendency at least in my country uh, for things to be very personalized and individualized as in somebody made a change or some person made a change whereas the fact of the matter is that in large democracies like india uh, change happens because a whole bunch of people get together and decide to bring about change so we got some good press uh, this is an article from uh, the lancet on the mental health care bill uh, as you will see it says mental health care bill 2012 because that was the the point at which the bill was ready to go to parliament uh, the policy um, got uh, some press this is from the wall street journal's india edition which covered india's new mental health policy saying it's radical but tough to implement um, so now where where are we in after last 3 or 4 years of effort the district mental health program uh, was revised by the policy group. so the policy group made a whole set of recommendations to change the district mental health program but not all of these aspects have been implemented largely due to budgetary issues uh, the indian government in this recent budget uh, very inexplicably cut the health budget uh, uh, the first national mental health policy for india was launched on world mental health day 2014 uh by the minister of health and family welfare it's now officially endorsed as government policy by the ministry uh however there have been no specific steps towards implementation of that policy and the mental health care bill the law is in parliament and is awaiting legislative time to be passed uh it's already been approved by the all party standing committee so hopefully at some stage somewhere down the line it it will get passed so i think what i would like to end with is to say that our really our job does not end because as you will see uh, none of this stuff has actually been implemented and 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 really the to bring about closure of the policy process uh, means that we uh, have implementation of the program we have implementation of the policy and we have implementation of the bill and and we are still far away from that and and so uh our engagement and our involvement will need to be continuous and it it needs to vary according to time i think we've had very high level of engagement with the government in the last 3 4 years uh it's become a bit less at the moment but maybe at some stage it will have to again increase to a high level 
so i'm going to end here and uh, thank you so much for being present and thank you so much for listening to me and finally thanks to all of you for providing me the opportunity to speak uh, briefly about our experience in the last 3 4 years thank you Mitra for, for your presentation and all your hard work of course. Um, can I invite uh, Mary and Brian up to discuss this? Have so we got about 10 minutes uh, for questions and answers? Oh, nothing of this was hard. <laughs> we got about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, George, are you going to be handling the microphone around? Um, I'm just going to do that. Got one. And I'm just going to phone Sumitra now. I'll Skype in Sumitra now. Um, hi, just as, this is just hi, for all of the speakers, really. Oh. <laughs> hi, Sumitra. Um, you spoke about having a unified voice. I will stay online. <laughs> yes, we're just starting the panel discussion now. Okay. So you spoke about having a unified voice, and um, there's actually quite a lot of divide about the global mental health movement and a lot of criticism. So how do you suggest to deal with that criticism and sort of that opposition? Oh, no. Over to you. <laughs> um, do you want to say more about what you see as the distinct views about global mental health? Um, uh, sort of... Uh, a view of um, medicalizing um, mental health, um, a med sort of it having a medicalized view, maybe a bit imperialist as well, bringing Western models into low and middle income countries and things like that. Okay, so this is being streamed live around the world and also we've been recorded for future uh, global viewing. So we have here in this um, large and steep auditorium in central London, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, perhaps 30, 35 um, experts, uh, many early career or junior colleagues. So we're going to have a quick show of hands. Do you think, A, that global mental health is actually trying to create a momentum where possible evidence-based that will actually improve the coverage and the quality of mental health care for the benefit of people throughout the world, as it, if that is a genuine initiative? Or B, and I'm characterizing a little bit, is a post-colonial imposition of Western medical models upon low and middle income countries. So please put your hand up if you think A. Okay, and now please put your hand up if you think B. Okay, so I can report to the global uh, uh, watching audience at uh, this event uh, that um, nobody uh, supported option B, that is a post-colonial imposition. Uh, I didn't ask for abstentions, any abstentions? Ah, ah, so there's actually about, what, half a dozen abstentions, and then perhaps uh, three quarters, perhaps 70, 80 percent saying that they think this is actually a genuine effort to improve mental health care. And that's what I would agree with. I would um, add to that that you should just fight it. This is like a weird mic. Um, you should fight, not fight it, but you should... Um, we have a responsibility to be evidence-based and if we can show evidence that the work that we do is culturally relevant, is um, carefully designed, is appropriate and is holistic and isn't just um, treatment in biomedical models. It includes, I mean you notice the three things, the three solutions that um, we should be aiming for. One of them is community-based treatment but it's integrated social care in the community. And the other two is protection of human rights and um, prevention and promotion of healthy environments to prevent mental disorders. So if we keep that holistic model, then I think that's the direction we should go in. So to come back directly to your question about how to actually unify the field, I think we have to have a series of debates to seek to create a well and broad-based consensus on this. There are some important points within the critique of the global health movement that have emerged in recent years. The idea that pharmaceutical in, uh, industries and contributions uh, may dominate mental health practice. That is not central to the vision of global mental health that I 
uh, I hold. I think that one must use a mixture of biological and social and psychological according to the evidence, according to what fits culturally and according to what's affordable. But in some countries it's clear that the majority of the provision of mental health care is simply pharmacological, and that's too narrow and that it isn't appropriate to the settings. Secondly, that the diagnostic categories that we have have been formulated in high-income countries and may not apply very much or not at all in some other settings. We have to test that out and to find if the new series of categorizations actually fit better. So that's, there's some validity in that. But the idea that this is somehow a conspiracy of global mental health research and activists in league with pharma, somehow wishing to oppress people in low income countries, is simply absurd. I, I just want to uh, color this a little bit. Is this working? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I absolutely agree with you, Graham, and and Mary, that you know the movement is, or what's called a movement, is doing trying to do good things. But I think we need to be very careful to keep inspecting what is being done in the name of global mental health because it's getting a lot of publicity, uh, there's a lot of money that's come into it, and I suspect that there are a lot of stupid, damaging things being done in its name. And we need to be vigilant about those and call them out for being what they are. Okay, just to respond to that, I think that's absolutely right. Any initiative may sort of ossify over time unless it's continually renewed and subject to self-criticism by, uh, by challenging each other, but particularly by peer review and what's based upon the evidence of what actually works. But Mary will have a view. Yeah, um, for me, that's one of the strengths of our innovation database, that we've got a broad range. If you want to know what's going on in global mental health, look at the 110 case studies we've got on the website and you'll see that the vast majority of them are integrated social care programs addressing holistic uh, culturally appropriate interventions i can't say well I, I don't know all 110 intimately but i would eat my hat if i had one if there were many which were purely that's what a liberal democrat said the other yeah. day about, uh, about the results of the election so be careful <laughs> So I'm going to make no comment on hat-eating or other consumption. Uh, but to say, although I'm a researcher, I think one needs to take a broader view uh, of the three E's that can guide us. The first is the evidence, where we have evidence and often we don't. The second is the ethics, particularly uh, being guided by the human rights considerations of what is actually the humane thing to do with people affected by mental illness and their family members. And third is experience, to be very much guided in each setting by people with their own experience of mental conditions and what they say is important to do to provide care and to increase support. So that's evidence, ethics, and experience. Um, we have a comment there, and it, I want to offer the opportunity to, to Mincha if he wants to chime in. Before. I would like to speak for my special place. I'm Sandra Fortes. I'm from Brazil, and Ricardo invited me to come here today. I'm passing by London, and last year there was a very big meeting in Rio, including several uh, internationally known professors and uh, especially people from Canada, the group from Kimaya, and that subject was very much discussed. So I think one of the points, and I totally agree that there is something a little, sometimes I think it's a little too paranoid on all this. But one aspect that I would like to talk about uh, and talking about this subject is the importance, the importance of reaching to solutions that are being used or having been used in culture, different cultural settings, you know, and how we can make them more known all over the world. Because when you come to only accepting evidence-based intervention, it's very difficult to do an evidence-based intervention and study in a third or in a, a low and middle income country. Ricardo and you all know that, I know that. So I think the innovation network gives this new uh, opportunity to, for us to exchange. And in this particular seminar, 
We studied several different things that are being done in Brazil. You know, there are no no trials; they are not being controlled, but they are being being implemented all over. Because sometimes there is no time to do evidence studies. So I think the innovation will bring over this um, criti criticism that is not really based on uh, facts. So it will build this bridge that we are looking for. Ricardo, I'm here if you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I lost you. Hello? Ricardo? We can, speak to yeah. them. We can hear you. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Do you want me to speak? I, uh, you want me to comment? I had a couple of things I would like yes, to add please. if there's time. Yes, um, if you can't. Yeah, I, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I mean, for me, uh, from, from where I sit and work from in India, I sometimes find there's a huge disconnect. Uh, between what gets uh, uh, discussed at, at say, uh, conferences on, say, global mental health and, and when I go down to the ground level here in India. And again, my comments are largely to do with my experience in India, and this may not at all apply to other countries and other places. But what I think what, we've, uh, what we probably need to do is to try and slightly refocus ourselves towards... Uh, uh, a bit away from health and a little bit more towards uh, the social. Uh, you know, I, I think I think talking about effective treatments is necessary, uh, but it's equally important that we talk about things like social inclusion. Uh, and and you know, when I I, I have a we have a large project uh, in in mental uh, in, in Gujarat currently where we are working with public mental health facilities to try and reorient them away from a purely medical approach and you realize that the disconnect between the facilities and the people taking their help is, is huge because people want something more than just treatment of any kind they want they want ways of being able to put their lives together again and, and somehow I think there's a bit of a bit of a failure on our part to articulate that process very well uh, I'll stop here and you know that's uh, all I really have to say that, that's great thank you Sumitra we may I want to bring you back again, so don't run yeah. away. Um, there are a couple of people. Um, can we check over so I can make your work easier? <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I'm not sure if my question is naive-ish, but is there any countries globally that you look to for setting quite a good example for global mental health? Or are there any countries or areas of any country that you think, or in your experience, you've taken certain aspects from because they've done quite a good job so far, or you see potential there to build upon here in the UK? Absolutely. Um, I think Ethiopia is a fantastic example. Um, they have an amazing capacity building program, which trains not only mental health researchers, um, PhD students in particular, but also trains psychiatrists, psychiatric nurses. Um, and they have an amazing center of excellence of um, mental health research in Addis Ababa University. So I think they're a really um, promising um, country. The, there's a, the person in the Ministry for Health in Ethiopia um, is um, amazing and is driving forward the mental health agenda very well. And they're now in the process of scaling up integration of mental health into primary care across Ethiopia. So I think they're a great example. India is the other fantastic example where at the national level you've got buy-in to make national level changes. So thank you for your question. I think we have to distinguish between formulating a strategy or a policy or a law uh, and implementing it. And the former alone is I think either useless or worse than useless because of all the time and goodwill that so many people put into setting up such a document and who are then disappointed if it's not implemented and who probably won't do that again. So I think it's an obligation on a commissioning group, usually a government, to actually enact what's been written as a large-scale, for example, national policy. Now, there are some examples, as Mary said, in some low middle income countries where the strategy has been put in place and actually very good, and Ethiopia is a recent example of that. I don't know many examples in low middle income countries where it's then been actually implemented in a thorough-going and full way. 
I think there are several examples in high income countries, and I could think in this country, England would be one, I think of New Zealand, Australia. I think there are some emerging examples, and I think particularly about South Africa, where they've deliberately adopted an integrated platform approach, namely that primary care staff will all be trained to detect and to treat people with mental illness. And they've done that through integrating the World Health Organization Mental Health Gap Intervention Guide into their generic non-communicable diseases guidelines. And that whole thing is now called PC101. The latest version is called PC101+. Plus. And there's a huge program across the country to train up staff to do that. General staff, not mental health staff, general staff in primary care. And we shall see whether that actually achieves its goals. But it's been taken seriously. So my critical issue, I think, is to very much urge and to work with governments to do implementation without which the policies are actually pretty useless. We're going to take a couple more and then we have to close down. Yeah, and the one at the back. Yeah, hi, thanks for a fantastic talk. I was just asking that as a part of this whole advocacy and raising the voice for mental health, are we also looking at communication as a mean of you know involving users? Because I've seen a lot of work around HIV, at least in India, and in, around leprosy <coughs> happening in India, where you're not only targeting the illness, you're kind of building, building a social movement around, around you know stigma and discrimination. So are you thinking of something on that line? Because a lot of corporate, you know, companies as a part of CSR are willing to engage in these kind of things. So yeah, maybe something else. Can you give me names? <laughs> 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 so uh, yes, I think the problem for MHIN as a kind of global network is that we're a kind of knowledge exchange network. Um, and really what you're talking about is the work of service user organizations to create a kind of advocacy movement. So we would be very supportive of those issues, but I think that's something that has to be developed at a local level. Um, and as I said, in the barriers to why mental health isn't uh, considered important yet, is, is that's one of the major reasons that we haven't got this kind of advocacy um, thing. Yeah. So the answer to your question is yes. So for two reasons, the active involvement of service users is absolutely critical. The first reason is that the strongest active ingredient to reduce stigma is social contact between people with and without experience of mental illness. Time and again, where you're looking at local small groups or a national level, that is what works. So if you don't have clear, committed contributions from service users, that's not going to go anywhere. The second issue, talking to policymakers, we've gone about evidence, but very often policymakers are moved by individual stories. Stories of individuals showing resilience, coping, often very difficult situation, and family members. And that's where they can be uh, motivated to actually put some effort into a policy initiative through individuals coming forward, because they're usually representative politicians. They're dealing in their constituents with individuals all the time. Often they may be numerically illiterate, or not necessarily, you know, statisticians. And the second point then is this is acting at the emotional level, not rationally. We're not trying to say 5% are treated. We're saying here is somebody who's a family who's actually in a terrible situation. We'd like you to sympathize and empathize and now to go and do something about it. Because of course, 75% of all of us have somebody in our families who has experienced mental illness and that applies at least as much to politicians. Maybe more because of the stress and strains they suffer doing their job. We actually don't have data about mental illness among politicians, but goodness knows how high those rates are. So yes, service users are absolutely critical to what we want to do. Hi. Yeah, thanks for the talk. That was very interesting. Um, you've talked about the need for gathering more evidence and also about the difficulty of getting onto the policy agenda um, with so many other priorities. Um, do you have good evidence yet that it's uh, as cost effective as something like, um, you know, distributing bed nets or deworming children or any of these other things that are competing for the resources? The basic answer to that is not enough evidence because there hasn't been enough research investment to know. We are, well not myself, the, we have colleagues at the World Health Organization, for example, who are doing that kind of modeling. And that's very much the kind of evidence that we're gathering for the scientific advisory for the World Bank meeting. So what is the cost benefit of, you know, if you put a dollar into mental health, how many dollars do you get back? 
I'm sure the cost benefit ratios are going to be favorable, but I have no idea what they're going to look like compared to something like malaria bed nets. And I think you have to um, draw a line and say, you can't only fund the most cost effective things. You've got to fund the things which have uh, the biggest impact on societal burden, which are, you know, affect human rights, which, you know, there's more than one reason for investing in things and getting your money back on the investment shouldn't be the only reason. Um, and we need more research to understand cost effectiveness a lot more because there's huge gaps in our knowledge. So we're building the evidence base. Um, colleagues in Geneva and WHO are working with uh, something called the One Health Tool, which is a sophisticated spreadsheet where you can do scenario planning about how much investment you put in, what coverage that produces, and what are the outcomes for large populations in any country. And that's in the context of a, a research program called Emerald that we're leading at the moment. But generically, we are too modest and too underconfident in the mental health field. We have sort of you know, learned helplessness. There's a very nice paper, and two papers actually, one in the British Journal of Psychiatry, one in the Lancet by Leucht, L-E-U-C-H-T and colleagues, a couple of years ago, looking at the effectiveness of mental illness treatments compared with treatments for the whole range of non-communicable diseases in terms of effect sizes. And we're slightly above the average for the effectiveness of our treatments compared with hypertension, diabetes, and other long-term conditions. So we should be more active in asserting that we do have evidence we can deliver but the full details about cost effectiveness, we don't have that chapter and verse yet. Okay. Uh, I think, okay, if it is a very brief one. <laughs> Submit. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, a very brief one. Uh, due to the nature of mental health, we cannot consider health alone because the impact is going to be on education, it's going to be on employment, it's going to be on carers, so on social care. How would you, if we do tackle the issue only on the health perspective, we may lose the battle. So how would you suggest to make the point before the other sector that mental health is, it is an important issue for them too? Um, do you have any? I mean, I would say all of the recent policy work has been around mental health. You cannot have sustainable development without mental health. Every, all the papers that Graham referred to all make the argument of how mental health is important across all the sectors. The economic modelling that's being done for the World Bank meeting is cross-cutting across all sectors, health, education, social welfare, benefits, the whole remit. There's no question that we're making the case for just health. It's a societal impact that we're hoping to have. And can I just say thank you for your beautiful illustrations on the Mental Health Innovation Network. Any drawings you see on our website? Thank you, Valentina. Um, so briefly, you're right. Uh, mental health crosscuts virtually everything else in some sense. In principle, we have to gather the data to show that we can do something about it. We might, among other things, look at the comorbidity question. So for example, people with infections like HIV or non-communicable diseases will approximately have twice the levels of anxiety and depression of their counterparts in the general population. So if you're HIV positive, you have access to antiretroviral treatment, and you're depressed, then on average you'll take your ART less often, and that will have a very bad or a fatal outcome of the effect of the HIV. So you can then, in principle, get better outcomes for the depression and for the HIV if you treat both at the same time. But I said in principle because we actually haven't got strong data on that yet. So I think we have to establish that evidence base, but also do that in a cross-sectoral way to change the argument into an evidence-based, strongly founded argument. May I offer, uh, may I offer uh, uh, Sumitra an opportunity to, to close this? Uh, is there anything else you want to add, Sumitra? Uh, no, Ricardo. Thank you. Okay, well, that, you know, the audience here would be very pleased to hear that because they're all ready to go and have a drink. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Sumitra, and thank you, Mary and Graham. So if you, uh, you're all invited to come for a drink. Um, uh, Georgia, where do they have to go? The North Courtyard, the atrium in the North Courtyard.